We're working our way through the Minor Prophets, and we've come to the book of Zechariah. And uh, as you might remember from our last video, Zechariah is uh, preaching to God's people who have come back from exile. And they are wondering about God's faithfulness to his promises. And uh, really, the key theme of Zechariah is that God remembers. But he opens up his book with a question. God remembers his promises. The question is whether or not you'll remember God. And he really calls on Israel to repent. And after that exhortation in chapter 1, verse 7, through chapter 6, verse 15, we find a series of visions. Some have called these a night visions because they all happen in one night. What a night for Zechariah. There are eight visions plus one. That's the way we uh, might describe them. Uh, because he says, I saw, chapter 1, verse 8. I saw, one eighteen. I saw, chapter 2, verse 1. I saw, 3, 1. I saw, 4, 1. I saw, 5, 1. I saw, 5, 5. I saw, 6, 1. And then 6, 9, he says something a little different. So we call them eight visions plus one. And the truth is, they are strange. They're, they're strange. Like our dreams, I guess, are strange, but these are prophetic dreams. And so get ready. They take a little work to understand, but still they have an order. There's an order, a structure, definitely, to the way these dreams are given to Zechariah. The first dream is related to the eighth dream. The second dream is related to the seventh dream. The third dream is related to the sixth dream, and then fourth and fifth those two dreams go together, and while some of the specifics are more difficult, the major themes are fairly clear. They're, they're dreams that make a point, visions intended to preach. And really what's happening is that Zechariah, God, is helping Zechariah address the current situation in Israel. And... Uh, in Israel, not the current one right now so much. Of course, it has application to that, but the current one in Zechariah's day, the current situation. And they had uh, been in exile, and now they had come back from exile, and there were a lot of great prophecies about what, were supposed to hap what was supposed to happen when they got back from exile. And yet, uh, and yet, they were confused because it didn't seem to be what was happening. To get you ready for these dreams, let me give you a reminder of kind of what the essence of the Old Testament prophets were about. Uh, and, and we're going to see how Zechariah, the reason why this is important is because we're going to see how Zechariah picks up on some of these themes and says, yeah, this is what these prophets have said. This is the essence of what they were saying to us. God hasn't forgotten. I know it looks bad, but God hasn't forgotten. These dreams say, God remembers. So there were four categories, as you read through the prophets, in which God revealed the future. Uh, there were prophecies about the spiritual destiny of Israel. There were prophecies about the Messiah. There were prophecies about the last days, the day of the Lord. And then there were prophecies about what God was going to do with ungodly nations and individuals. So there were prophecies about the spiritual future of Israel, prophecies about the Messiah, prophecies about the day of the Lord, and then prophecies about what God was going to do with ungodly nations and individuals. And of those different sets of categories, there were three chronological categories. So some of those prophecies that we read about have already been fulfilled, timing-wise. Some are being fulfilled, and then some are still to be fulfilled. Now, of those prophecies that have not been fulfilled yet, and this is key to understanding the visions, because this was true in Zechariah's day, one was the recovery of the land of Palestine by Israel. So when the prophets spoke about the future, they spoke about the recovery of the land. And to a certain extent, I guess in Zechariah's day, they had been given the land, but not not really. They, they only had Jerusalem and a little bit of land around Jerusalem that they could call theirs. And it wasn't nearly what uh, the prophets had promised would happen after the exile. Two, when it came to prophecies about the future that hadn't been fulfilled, one was the land. Two was the future spiritual salvation of Israel. The prophets talked about a time when the 
Israel would receive the spirit, repent, be new, you know, know God, want to do the law. That wasn't happening yet. And then third, Israel's enemies were supposed to be defeated. And you read Isaiah, Jeremiah, I mean, just massive defeat of Israel's enemies. And then uh, fourth, the Messiah and his kingdom would be established. The Messiah would rule from Jerusalem. And so they were in exile and something happened. Obviously, Cyrus sent them back to build the temple. And so that was exciting, but still they got back to Jerusalem and a lot of those other things that had been prophesied were not happening. And so they had a lot of questions, just kind of like we sometimes have a lot of questions about God's promises. They had a lot of questions. And that's why God meets with Zechariah in the middle of the night and gives them, gives him to give them this series of visions. And the first vision is found in verse 7 of chapter 1 through verse 17. And it's kind of a general vision and uh, a theme vision, you might say. It sets the tone for them all. And the question really of this vision is, does God still care? That's what this vision answers. The setting you find in verse 7. It's two months after Haggai's last message. And the overall uh, vision is of a horseman or horsemen who patrol the earth and an angel asking questions about Jerusalem and Zechariah being given a message. If you read it, that's kind of the plot, I suppose. And the theme seems to be, while Jerusalem is in trouble, God will not forget his promises to Jerusalem and he assures Jerusalem of future good. If you look more specifically, you find a man riding on a red horse. I saw a man, behold, a man was riding on a red horse. Red sounds like a strange color for a horse in English, but not in Hebrew. It's just basically dark chestnut. In fact, some translate this as a brown horse. People will talk about the significance of the different colors of the horses. Uh, maybe there's some significance, but it kind of feels like guessing to me. Um, certainly, the horse had to have some color, <laughs> and, uh, it, and Zechariah noting the color makes the vision more vivid. That's for sure. So he's standing among the myrtle trees. Uh, and a myrtle was an evergreen flowering shrub that's common throughout Palestine. In the later part of the Old Testament, it's mentioned among the trees that testify to the prosperity of the Messianic age. And so he's standing there with different horses. He sees this man riding and then he's standing among the myrtle trees, this vision of future prosperity, and he's got different color horses behind him. And Zechariah sees that, verse 9, and he asks the angel a question. And uh, this is what he does in almost every vision. He asks the angel a question, and the angel answers. And we might call this angel the interpreting angel. And he explains the visions to Zechariah. He's described here as the angel who was speaking with me. And this is his explanation. He says, there are angels that God sends to patrol the earth, which of course is telling us something about the invisible world. There are supernatural angelic beings who play some role in what's happening in this world at God's command. And they're described here as patrolling, which seems later to have to do with watching and observing. And these angels speak to the angel of the Lord in verse 11. And once again, he's described as standing among the myrtle trees. And uh, so the angel of the Lord, you have the interpreting angel who's explaining things to Zechariah. And then you have this angel, the angel of the Lord. And it's an interesting description. He's set apart. Uh, the angel of the Lord you'll find throughout the Old Testament at the most basic level is a heavenly being sent by God to deal with men as his personal agent. But in many passages, he's basically just identified with God. And he doesn't just speak in the name of God, but he speaks as God. He's sometimes even represented as having a divine nature. He's sometimes called by the proper name of God. So this, this angel is different than the interpreting angel. And uh, here he's seen as receiving the report of the messengers in verse 11. And then he speaks to God as a kind of mediator. How long, he says, will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you've been angry these 70 years? So the angel of the Lord speaks to God and says, God, have you forgotten your promises? And that's a beautiful picture of what Jesus is doing. It's not surprising 
that the angel of the Lord is serving as a mediator because the angel of the Lord really, many people think it's a Christophany, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. And uh, that's why he's seen as having a divine nature. And yet in some ways he, er, he's able here and we can see to speak to God. So there's a mystery to this, but it's Jesus. He, he's a mediator and he's pleading with God the Father on behalf of Jerusalem. And God responds to his question, the angel of the Lord's question, but he doesn't here speak back directly to the angel of the Lord, but instead speaks to the interpreting angel. And in his response, we see God's attitude towards Jerusalem. He answered gracious and comforting words. The Lord answered the angel who was speaking with me, gracious, comforting words about Jerusalem. And that's really what the first four visions all have in common. They're very different, but they're all centering on Jerusalem. He says, uh, and one, I'm exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem. Uh, he says, Jerusalem will be inhabited. He says, the Lord will again choose Jerusalem. And then he talks about the Lord having chosen Jerusalem. So obviously a big part of the purpose here is to encourage the people who have returned from exile to Jerusalem that God has not forgotten Jerusalem, even though it might look like he had. You can definitely understand why they needed that encouragement. And here we see that the circumstances they were going through were not a good indication of God's attitude towards them. What was God's attitude? Verse 14, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion, and I, I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. This is God's basic attitude, and this is quite an encouragement to repent. Remember, in the beginning of the book, he's calling on them to repent. They were probably struggling to repent because, and they would have used it as an excuse. It doesn't seem like God cares about Jerusalem. He doesn't seem like God cares about his promises. God gives Zechariah a vision to say, yeah, God cares. Even if it doesn't look like things are happening, things are happening, and God's not going to give up on this attitude, and God's not gonna give up on the promises he's made. But of course, this in the end is dependent on Israel's repentance. If you repent, God says, I will return. And they might say, but look at our circumstances. And God says, no, you can't judge my attitude by your circumstances, this is really my attitude. Then God makes a statement and a promise in verse 16 and 17. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion, my house will be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. Again, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities will again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. And that promise was partially fulfilled in Zechariah's day. The, the temples were rebuilt, the walls were built up, but it seems like this promise is actually even bigger than that and refers to days yet to come. Now, second vision. So that's the first vision. God hasn't forgotten Jerusalem. There's, he, he's going to do what he said in the, in the for, former prophets. He remembers. He remembers. Second vision, verses 18 through 21. Uh, the first question, does God care about Jerusalem? Second question, what about these powerful nations who have defeated Israel? And uh, so he's given this reassuring promise in the first vision now he's going to start explaining the, in the second vision how it's going to happen. And we see in bold print, horns and craftsmen. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there were four horns. And the theme seems to be, while Israel was sent into exile for their sin, God will punish the nations who took advantage of this opportunity. I do remember, he's basically saying, I will punish your enemies. Specifically, this vision and the next seem to be further explaining the first vision. These are the kind of gracious and promising, encouraging words that God must have spoken to the interpreting angel. Zechariah says he lifts up his eyes, he sees four horns, and he says that lifts up his eyes quite a bit. It's like after receiving this intense vision, he almost looks down thinking, and then he's shown something else. He lifts up his eyes. Horns, powers, I saw, right, we live in Africa, we saw, we've all seen rhinoceros, uh, even in uh, real life, not just at the zoo, but in one of these game parts, parks, and if you see a rhinoceros that close to you, you look at that horn, it's, it's obviously an image of power and strength, and that's how it's used in uh, the Old Testament, uh, as an image of power and authority. Here we see what it is, it's the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem, so 
These horns are representing nations that have attacked God's people. So Assyria would be one, Babylon would be one, Greece in the future, every other nation that sought to do damage to God's people. And after seeing these horns, God shows Zechariah four craftsmen, uh, carpenters really, blacksmiths, someone who made weapons, I think would probably be uh, what he's talking about. And Zechariah asks, what are these craftsmen going to do? And God explains, we saw the horn that hurt Israel. Now, he says, these craftsmen are going to be used by God to do the same to the nations who attack God's people. So what's this telling us, really? There's a wide focus in the first vision. I will remember my people. And then in this vision, it gets a little more specific. God says, I'm going to prove that I remember my people by punishing Israel's enemies, just like I said I would. And all this is based on God's promise. God remembers. A long time ago, God promised Abraham that those who curse his descendants would be cursed. Those who bless them would be blessed. And now we see all these years later that God is going to be faithful to that promise. He never forgets his promises. The problem we have sometimes, of course, is that it's difficult for us to trust that God hasn't forgotten. We're like children, you know. Sometimes they have a very hard time believing that you're going to keep your promises if uh, keeping your promise takes a while. And so you have to come back again and again to your children and say, Daddy hasn't forgotten. And so often God needs to do that with us, which is what he's doing in this second vision. And in the third as well, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, he's, uh, has God forgotten Jerusalem? First vision. What about Jerusalem's enemies? Second vision. What exactly is going to be the future of Jerusalem? That's the third vision. And we see a man with a measuring line. Um, and... Zechariah says, uh, he, he lifted his eyes once again and looked. Behold, there was a man with a measuring line in his hand. And again, like after the first vision, he has sort of looked down to think. And now he has to look up again. And the theme of this vision is that God will rebuild a new and more prosperous Jerusalem. And I think this is, again, what it will look like for God to return to his people if they return to him. God loves Jerusalem. Their enemies are going to be defeated. And now, let's look at this. We see a man with a measuring line in his hand. And you see this man in Ezekiel 40 and Revelation 11. But it's positive here. Why does he have this measuring line? He's going to measure Jerusalem. It's like someone measuring the city so that he can make sure Jerusalem is restored to what it used to be. He's like, let's measure this out so that we can make sure to establish the city the way it used to be. And Zechariah is still with the interpreting angel at this point when another angel comes to speak to the interpreting angel and gives him an order. He says, run and say to that young man, the, the man measuring, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. And again, the image is prosperity. So much prosperity that God actually is like, you don't even need to measure Jerusalem. And the concern, of course, would be security. That's why you have walls. <laughs> He said, you don't even need to measure Jerusalem. It's going to be so big, you're not going to be able to contain it with walls. But people might say, well, then we're not going to be safe. So God gives a promise. I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord, and I will be the glory in her midst. And that's the fulfillment of a promise made back in Ezekiel 43, verse 2. Now, in verse 6 of chapter 2, God applies this promise. You've come back from Babylon. Why? Why? The nations mistreated God's people. That's what Babylon did. And in mistreating God's people, they were making an attack on God. And so God says, look, I want you to know I love you. Verse 8, for thus said the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. And what's he saying? He's saying, God, his goal is the prosperity of Jerusalem because these nations uh, mistreated Jerusalem, when you repent, God is going to punish uh, these nations because you are his people. You are the apple of his eye. And when they attacked you, it was like they were poking uh, the apple of God's eye. And the result will be that God's people will rejoice and God himself will come and dwell in the midst of them. Zechariah says God's plans go even beyond the nation of Israel, however, and they always have. Israel was chosen by God for a purpose. He says, many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. My people. They won't just be a people anymore. They will be my people. And yet in the middle of that, of course, God still has a special relationship with Israel, verses 11 and 12. The Lord will possess Judah 
as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. So we've got Israel wondering in the book of Zechariah, what is God doing? Zechariah calls them to repent and return to God. You're wondering, does God remember us? I'm wondering, do you remember God? You need to remember God. That's the problem. If you remember God, what's going to happen? One, he, he is going to punish the nations. He is going to care for you, his people. And what that means is that Jerusalem will be prosperous. The nations will be judged. But some among the nations will be saved. And God will dwell with his people. And therefore, what should God's people do? They should obey. They should be silent. They should trust in God to come and rescue them. That's the first three visions of Zechariah's uh, eight plus one set of visions in the first seven chapters. And we'll look at the rest next time.